Hey, Charles. Charles, is my is this music way louder than it needs to be? I've never tried streaming music before. I uh, I love this um, I love this artist so much. His name is Witan Witan W I T A N, and. Um, I was like, dude, I want to, I want to stream this guy's, uh, I want to stream this guy's music, but I'm afraid of getting like a, uh, what the hell is that called? Like copyright strike. And so I was like, you know what? Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm just going to email him. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I emailed this, I emailed the artist and I was like, Hey man, I love your music. Can I, can I play this while I'm like doing live stuff? He's like, well, what do you do? I said, I just do like tabletop RPG stuff. He was like, hell yeah. So YouTube, I have the permission of the uh, artist. If I could just move this over a little bit. There we go. All right. So I don't know who uh, is interested in joining. Um, I'm just working on my solo campaign here. And uh, we're getting into the, uh, the nitty gritty part. If you've um, if you ever wrote tabletop RPGs, this is kind of this is kind of a tough a tough moment in the game in that uh, you have, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is the kind of stuff where it's like music that doesn't hijack your thinking by pulling you into lyrics or whatever. Um, so I've got like the the, the skeleton of, of what I want to do here. I've got the things I wanted to add. The biggest thing I wanted to add is like some sort of schematic for creating a companion, which is like I didn't want this to be like a four against darkness where you have to manage four people, but I was like, it'd be cool if you could have one person with you. So I created like this companion module and uh, just a basic way, like a quick way to roll up a companion so you don't have to do a full character creation. And uh, also some, some different mechanics for giving the companion like their own personality, I guess you might say. Oh, sorry. Um, so I didn't want it to be that like the companion completely had a mind of their own. I think that would be kind of tedious. Um, but I thought maybe there'd be a way to like have it so that you could be like, okay, like what does my companion want to do? Do they want to... Um, you know, do they want to go with me on this adventure? Are they happy about it? And so I created this companion coherence table, uh, which tells you like rationally and emotionally how they feel about like the decision you're making. And um, so that's like kind of cool. But then I was like, you know, though, like the problem with that is there's like different things that are going to affect that. And so this is a, like a turning point for me that I get into which is I, I'll start to be like, well, we can make this a little more realistic. And then I, I can't stop. And to the point that I have this extremely complicated system. So I just created this companion disposition thing to go along with this. And it's easy in that there are like mental and physical considerations that make your companion in like a better or worse mood. And so if you could imagine this little chart printed out here, um, if you start in the middle at zero and something, you know, you might, con you might say, okay, you say to your companion, um, what do you say we eat at this restaurant? I mean, it's probably not a thing you're going to do, but just, just like a, just a way to think about it is like, do you want to eat at this restaurant? So you go to this com companion coherence table and you're like, okay, basic straight up one to 12, see what they want to do. But then you're like, well, what like, is there anything affecting that? And basically with this com companion disposition chart, you look at what they're feeling at that moment, you know, so you, like really any physically positive things, physically negative things. So they're feeling energized and well-rested. Great. That's a positive. 
uh, they're feeling, feeling tired and discouraged, that's a negative, whatever it is. You then just like imagine a token at this zero, you move it in the direction of whatever benefit it is. So if they're feeling both positive, like mentally and physically, that's a plus two on the co companion coherence table. So in that way, it becomes more likely that they're gonna do what you wanna do, but it's not definitive, right? If you roll a one on this and they have a plus two, you only roll a three. And so if you roll a three, they're like, yeah, I'll eat there, but they're not thrilled about it, right? Um, and so it's just like a little shift. It, it can be po it could be up to plus two or down to negative two and that's it. And it just sort of gives a little bit of a realistic personality to them. And you don't have to like constantly be monitoring their, uh, their disposition, right? Like sometimes they're in a good mood, sometimes they're not in a good mood. And, and when you wanna kind of check, you could just do a quick tally of this. So, so that's an idea. Um, so I also added this function for like a collaborative skill check where if you really wanna do something, you can do it together. Um, but I think I put some conditions on that. And so let's see. Working with companion. Da, da, da. Okay. Companion skill checks function much like skill checks of your own character. Failed rolls, advanced threat clocks, and rolls of one or two activate the dragon or demon effects. Whenever possible, those effects should focus on your companion or both you and your companion together. Um, so both you may roll, and then you take the better result of these rolls. So basically, a collaborative skill check means that you get pretty much roll with advantage because you get you get to roll with your uh, a die for you and a die for your companion and then you take the better roll um and what's cool about that is like um you can only roll this once per location so in default breach the solo is divided up by missions and in this is divided up by locations uh, and each location has a running threat clock rather than a mission threat clock. So that like if you are in the outskirts and your threat clock is at like a three and then you leave the outskirts and you come back to it later, that threat clock is still at a three. Okay. Um, and then what I did is, <clears throat> and I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to get this out because I have a bunch of junk here. By the way, I recently... Um, bought this thing, which I promised I would never buy this thing. It's the Game Master's Book of NPCs. The only reason I got it is because this is literally the only Oracle that I can find that has names in it. Because I wanted something that gives me random names because like, for some reason, I can come up with 57 different like recipes to make with corn on the spot. But like when I come up with names, the names are always like Cliff um or Qbert or something and so I got this for names but that's not what I want to talk about uh no don't throw <laughs> Charles don't throw yours in the trash that is so good uh I actually had to like stop myself from stealing yours because it was so good um I wanted to give a real place on the Misty Vale map for this whole adventure but I didn't want to like barge in on anything else that's happening on the map. And so basically, if you look right here, like outskir oops, outskirts is right here. And the place where my adventure takes place is called the green. And what I chose, let me see if I could focus it here. Okay, right there. You see in the mountain pass right here where like there's this little pass and then there's this little arrowhead. You could imagine it being like an arrowhead. That is the space that I chose to be like the um, the the green, the place called the green, and it's uh, um, and and I kind of made an outline of it here because you can't you could take um, you could refer to stuff under the the Dragonbane the Free League Dragonbane thirty third party license. You can refer to stuff in the Dragonbane rulebook and core stuff. You cannot take it word for word though, and you can't take any pictures or anything like that. And so I, I suck at art. And so I was like, well, I'll just like make a diagram here. And then I laid out these different things as like the three little towns. And so this is a hidden part of the map where the frog people live, the uh, frog kin. And they hate noise. 
and so the group that I made up like this this uh this group is called the whisper hands because it does say one of the things it says in the best jury is that frog people do not they're they they usually communicate through hand gestures and they're very quiet I said that they're long of tongue yet short of word um in fact they hate speaking so much that I wrote that like when the babies are born they don't even cry they just like move their fingers in the 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 sim the hand sign for for crying and this language I decided and this will probably win me an academy award for creativity the language is called hoppin <laughs> H O P P E N. Uh, they speak Hoppin, which I just think is so cute. And basically, they took themselves off the Misty Vale. Um, yes, they communicate like Dro, but they're not mean. They're really sweet. Uh, they took themselves off the map. That's just like a little drawing. You could literally see like the lines on my sheet of paper there. Um, they took the 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 green off the map because they don't. When they had it on the map, people would come and they were really loud. And so what happens in this in this game, though, is that these three trolls wake up and these trolls um, who are basically the big threat clock. So each location has a threat. But then overall in the game, there's this threat clock running for trolls and the trolls are the troll of the forest, Duhalda, the troll of the mountain, Ulfagar. And then Avengavel is the troll of the swampy caves because the green is like a swamp that's covered by forest, okay? And so these threat clocks advance, but they're not like the threat clocks in Deep Fall Breach because the threat clocks in Deep Fall Breach, like every time something happens, you roll. Um, these are sequential. So each time we advance a number, so say that we like, we get a one, we activate a troll threat clock for Duhelda. And each of them advance for different reasons, right? Say we, we, we activate the threat clock for Duhelda. We go to one and that will tell us what Duhelda is doing when we roll a one. So it'll be like Duhelda has woken up and moved like down the cliff. And each of these numbers will represent different actions that will compel you into a response, right? And so maybe, I haven't written all these yet, but maybe at number eight, it's like Duhelda has started attacking one of the, the towns in the green. And so it's like, okay, I, I either need to react to that, or if I don't, that town is going to get messed up. Um, and so one, when you activate a troll threat clock, you just roll a 1d6, uh, and it will tell you which of the, the threat clocks is activated. So that, that's the other um, kind of innovation here is that we have these uh, these threat clocks for both locations that are consistent uh, and they accumulate over time. And these are sort of the newer locations here. Um, uh, the, the stink cup is my favorite one. That's gonna be like the big showdown at the end. The outskirts is the only one from the actual like core rule book that I, I am making into a location in this game just because with like any other location, say you go to like the Temple of the Purple Flame, you can just look in the adventure guide for information on that. But it's if you use the stuff in the outskirts to like start this solo adventure, it'll be really confusing because you're basically starting like the main campaign. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, the 66 drop the ones. Yeah, you know, I, this is kind of curious when I say this, like there are some dice rolls that are more fun than other dice rolls. I don't know. And I can't name why I can't name why like, and, and some of them make absolutely no sense. Like I hate rolling D tens. I don't know why I just maybe hate the die, but then like the number of die you're rolling and the choices you get from them. Um, it all, it all kind of, uh, synergizes okay so also I should just say before I start working on this and I know I'm like talking to just seven people and I love you all for just chatting with me um, oh did I get kicked off I don't see the chat anymore hmm oh there it is um, 
Okay, yeah, you can see I'm starting to like fill in all the different uh, locations. So I have like the little quote to start all the locations, and then I have whether they're like a town or a dungeon, because towns you don't have to go in order. Um, and then that's yeah. So this is also like the 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 map that I worked on, um, which I need to fill it in a little bit more. Um, you know my uh, uh, let me I, I don't know why, but I can't. Uh, can't get it to scroll up anymore. Hold on. I'm gonna try to. Okay, that should. No. Why is it doing this? Well. Okay. Um. I guess I'll just X that and then put it up here. There we go. Uh, yeah, this is the map I'm working on. And uh, if you if you look here you can kind of see the path that I intend the players to make. Again, I couldn't take this from the, uh, the I couldn't just copy this from the core book. I mean, that's like taking their intellectual property. So I had to like make my own version of it. Um, but you can kind of see, if you look on the Misty Vale map, there's that lake in the middle here, and then you have the outskirts. And from the outskirts, you travel up and over, um, like by the temple past that and then you can see that arrow is like where the action takes place that's the green all right and within the green then within the green there are going to be um three different locations so yeah i'm kind of at like a little bit of a i don't want to call it a boring part of this creative process because it's not boring it's just a little bit tedious where like you have the whole um like the bones of it all and now i just have to like fill in all the locations and the part of this that's like a that gets a little bit tedious uh in that respect is that it's like Okay, I'll, I'll give you, for example, like the outskirts right now. I have this little blurb, right, that, that kind of, you know, introduces the character to the situation. It's the same here every day. People come in and, and out talking about madness and bloodshed and sorcery and prophecies. Some you see the next day, some you never see again. That's why I always make them pay their tab. Okay, so you get an idea of like the flavor of what's going on in the outskirts. And then you list these these waypoints, right? So we have Everly's Tavern, which is the new tavern I created as like the competitor to the three stags. And I have some like things that might be of interest here. Interestingly, when you're playing solo, you can't do, one of the biggest things you can't do is hide anything from yourself. You know, the only way to hide information is to not look at it. But once you look at it, it's unhidden. And so there's lots of stuff in general uh, GM guides that will be like, if the characters talk to this person, then you can give them this mission. Or if the characters find this object, you can do this. But it's just you. And so all that I can really do is give people leads. And then from those leads, they can create something from it. But the problem that I'm having is and this is a problem in a lot of solo games that are not completely open-ended. The problem is that when you, um, when you have these like narrative pieces in the very beginning of the game, there is a fear that the player can set up a reality in the game that cannot, that might have to be violated later. Right. And so you can't set up too much narrative firmness. You just have to, you, you just have to go with like with some leads here. For instance, the bartender's Claudia, mid 30s. OK, looks like she's no stranger to having occasionally grab a patron or two or six by the scruff and throw them out on the street. So say I could say, oh, you know, Claudia can join my party. Well, if Claudia is now in my party, I have to consider what that means is Claudia, you know, uh, what if she's supposed to be in the narrative sometime later and she's been in my party the whole time, right? And so if you're an experienced soloist, you, you know how to adapt to those things. You can kind of like bring the timelines into, uh, you know, into synchronicity. But for a newer soloist, that could be a little bit dangerous. So 
I'm setting up a, some vague plot at the beginning, but I really have to focus on making things open-ended. Um, so right now I'm set, I set up like, so this is the inn and the bar is Everly's Tavern. And then Bradley and Sons is, I'm making this like the one stop. This is the blacksmith. This is the, the item. You could buy items. You could buy rations here and everything. Um, and I just give like a little bit of like a background. Now, one thing that's in the uh, adventure guide in Outskirts is this guy, uh, Dranith maybe is the name. And Dranith um, is someone that you can get, and this is spoilers, I guess, but this is like the first part of the Dragonbane uh, mission. It's right after the opening scene, you're in the outskirts. So, I forgot what this dude's name is. Yeah, Dranith. Okay. So, Dranith is this person who I don't really want Dranith to be part of this story because Dranith is part of this other story, right? But the thing about Dranith is uh, Dranith can teach um, magic users. Okay. And so, I want to create. Um, I want to I want to create someone equal to that. And so we'll maybe say that you use Dranith um, and say that, okay, so we'll say that this is, um, let's give a little nod to uh, Wim Wenders. We'll say that this person is Bim Benders. And um, the local uh, recluse who does a lot of um, hollering at the local kids um, in, oh geez, in between sessions, long sessions of being reclusive. <laughs> so just give a little people, uh, you know, if, if anyone's interested in hearing this, um, I try to write the the la the lazy unrefined version of what I want to say first and then I'll go back and edit it later because if I get stuck in a lot of wording problems I never advance anything. And so is this really what I want to say about Bim Benders? Do I even really want this person to be named Bim Benders? I, I don't know, but I need to get the idea down, okay? So Bim Benders, a local recluse who does a lot of hollering at the local kids in between long sessions of being reclusive. Um, uh, so mm, we'll not call this Bim Benders because we want to say who's inside. We'll want to say um, rickety old house. And we'll say that who you can find in there is Bim Benders. Um, a house on the edge of town that is also on the edge of collapsing. Someone definitely lives there and they don't really mind what the neighbors think of them. Great. So we'll say that this is Bim Bender's house and that um, Bim Bender's is local recluse and uh, between long session, uh, in between long sessions of being reclusive and um, we'll say um, a bit ornery but doesn't necessarily shoo uh, visitors off right away, especially if they seem to have a purpose. Teacher. Bim can teach the players one of his skills as well as so let's see what skills Dranith had. Dranith has, okay. 
for a fee of three gold coins per shift. Skills and spells. Okay. Um, Draneth Bim can teach the players his skills and spells for two gold pieces for the first um, for three gold pieces for sh per shift. I'm making stuff a little bit easier. Oops, sorry. Making stuff a little bit easier um, for the first time stuff happens. So for instance, like I make the prices cheaper the first time you go to these places and then after you've been to the green, I increase them. And that's just because as a solo player, you just, you know, if I am a, um, if I'm playing in a group of five people, I'm going to have an easier time getting together three pieces of gold. Um, as a solo player, it's going to be a little more difficult. So we'll say that Bim can teach the players, can teach, let's just say that can teach his skills and spells for three gold pieces per shift. Two gold pieces for the first skill and the first spell. But advanced to three after that. Okay. Um, use the entry for Draneth on page, I think it's 29. Yeah, 26 of, on page 26 of the Dragon Bane Adventures book. So yeah, that's sort of, this is what's kind of like amazing um, for writing these supplements that is like, I can't explain to you after struggling so much with like trying to create these systems and everything and learning so much. I mean, I learned, I've learned so much over this last year, but I can't even begin to explain like how much of a relief it is to just be like, refer to some other thing for the rules <laughs> because it's like, it's like, when you are creating um, an RPG, one of the problems that I, you often run into is like, do I really have anything better to offer here than like what other games are offering? Or is this like an act of vanity, you know? Because really, I don't want to put anything out in the world that like, and, and claim that this is the best thing. If there's something that's better than it, I want people to do the thing that's better. Now, in my own personal exercises of trying to improve my my game writing capability and everything, that's fine. But I really do think that there's a lot of systems that put themselves out in the world and they're just like, hey, this is the best uh, system. And it's like, well, it's really not. And I think you know it's not. It's just your system. I'm not saying your own system has to be the best, et cetera. But like, I think you guys know what I'm saying. Price adjustment is a nightmare if your market goods and economy is static. Yeah, so that's another thing here is that the, um, Availability, once you go to the green, in addition to uh, increasing the prices, uh, the it starts by having, at Bradley and Sons, It's when you first start the game, It's if you look at B here, all common items are for sale, and then uncommon items open up if you've been to the green. But again, you just use the prices in, in the core rule book, which is, which is pretty great. Um, I need to, oops, I don't know what happened. Uh, I need, I don't know what's, my chat box keeps disappearing. It's very annoying. Okay, yeah, let me put it on top. All right. So, so I think that's good for rickety old house. And because not all of these have to have like 500 things, but we should create some other sort of encounter here. So why don't we say four, um, how about a dark alley? Um, an alleyway between rows of buildings looks a little bit damp and a little bit smelly. 
But it's dark, and... Uh, but it's dark, and... Looks a little bit damp and a little bit smelly, but it's dark, and you've, and who doesn't like, who doesn't at least want to try walking down a damp, dark alley by themselves? You only live once. Okay, so again, this is definitely not like a description I'm going to be keeping, but um, it's something there. And so let's have what kind of we should have a surprising encounter here. What's a nice encounter we can have? So we'll say um, Teddy P, uh, an individual. Oh boy. Sorry, everyone, I, I just took my carpal tunnel brace off and it's not off to a great start. An individual who calls themselves Teddy P has, uh, is trying to get your attention. They have a deal for you. What are the circumstances and can they be trusted? Age, gender, and uh, accoutrement unable to be ascertained. Again, it's a dark alley. All right, um, let's see here. Half tall door. Uh, what a curious arched door you find on the back of one of these buildings. A light seems to be emanating from underneath. It could be exciting, or it could be a really bad idea. Should you open it? Now this is, again, this is not a great prompt. Uh, we'll have to refine that, it's, it's pretty remedial, but this is like a really good, uh, how should I say this? This is a really good solo prompt to me, because it's like, you have this door, I've never met a door in a game that, or like a box that I don't want to open. But this is a perfect time to use, to break out the oracles, you know? What is in that box? What's there, or what behind that door? What's there, you know? And you can create a thread from that. Those are, those are the prompts I really want to, I, I really want to focus on. So we have this half tall door. Uh, we'll definitely punch that up a bit. Um, and then we'll say um, a cry for help. Uh, you know what? Hmm. So, um, in the you know, I talked about location threats. I created some new location threats for the outskirts so that if your threat clock for this location goes up, I have some new options. And I thought that one of them was that you heard someone scream. Okay, uh, a cry for help. Uh, you hear a faint shout somewhere further down the alleyway. You can't quite figure out if it is a distress call or not. When... Um, Whoever made the sound had a lot of emotion behind their voice. That stinks. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, that's a nice hook there. Okay, so we have Dark Alley. 
Yeah, this is fine. I'm trying to think. What else do we have? Uh, a, a deactivated barn. What is a deactivated barn? It's gone. You deactivated the activated barn. Um, I'm trying to think here what else we could put in the outskirts. So we have someone, because we need the basics, right? We, have, we need somebody that teaches spells. We need somebody that sells stuff. We need like a blacksmith. We need an inn. We need it, you know, and, and you can always look in the adventure book and go with, with anything that's there. But I'm just trying to think like, what else do we need in the outskirts? So we have to make sure. So we have the village square. Uh, let's um, let's actually create a, a new entry for the village square. So we'll say the village hmm, square. Um, While few can say, oh, I, I really have to get better at scrolling so all you can follow along. Well, few can say that the village square of the outskirts is a place of great debate and inquiry. It nevertheless has all the hustle and bustle you would ever want in a public space. Today, there seems to be quite a few characters vying for your attention. Good. Okay. See, this is this is like the nightmare of um, working preliminarily on Word is you're constantly fighting with your margins, especially when you use... Um, Especially when you use columns, it's like, ugh, you're, it's, it's horrible. Folks, it's horrible. Folks, it's horrible. A lot of people using columns. A lot of people have said that they're using columns in their RPG. We, we try to do it. We try to do it, but it doesn't always work. Uh, okay, let's see here. I'm just trying to... Yeah, so here's the location threats right now. Get a second to look at that. Um, I don't know how many people are here. Uh, doesn't matter. I'm happy that anybody's here, but we're just going through my uh, solo supplement and punching it up a little bit, adding some things. So feel free to just hang out. Let's see here. So we're in the village square. And we'll go, oop, what the hell? And we'll go with, uh, oh man, this is, no, okay. So we'll say the first person is Sonia Shuttlesworth. Yeah, anything's better than one note. One note's like, it's like, should be on against the, like the one note, uh, the uh, UN like convention on torture to subject people to one note. Um, Miss Sonia, no, uh, let's say a woman in her late teens or early twenties who is standing on a wooden box um, telling passerbys about a new um, device that will solve all of their adventuring needs. What is the device? Whatever it is, it certainly is not going to be free. How do you pluralize passerbys? P 
passers-by. Oh man, I don't want that to be the word that exists. Passers-by? All right. Uh, okay, so on your shell is worth good. That's something. I don't know how I feel about that. But then we'll say... Uh, Tekla Reeves. Tekla used to travel around the Misty Vale preaching about the return of, quote, the Great Balance. Stating that the long hidden dragons and demons that once ruled the land were both preparing to make their return. Um, the, okay, Tekla, uh, Tekla is now in his 70s and so hasn't done much traveling lately other than to and from the village square and his boarding home where he sleeps and scribbles mad writings on napkins though he certainly appears to be quite unwound there is a strange coherency to his speech what is he saying hey gsg what is he saying? Does it make any sense? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking this is probably, this is probably the way to go with these prompts now that I'm thinking about it. It's probably, I hate to do this. This is good prompts for towns. I wouldn't want to do this, these kind of prompts when we're like going through dungeons because I would want something definitive to build on so that encounters could be created and treasures could be found and stuff like that. But in villages, you're really populating, you know, you're really populating the, the world, right? And so we need to start like creating threads here that if, if not to create narrative possibilities, then at the very least, um, Oh, no worries, GSG. Get 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 that boy to school. We'll see you later on. Um, you know, at least the possibilities that they can come back to it. And if not, it just makes it feel lived in and it makes it feel like <laughs> it makes it feel um inhabited. It makes it feel like something interesting. Which like it you know, it's that's life, right? I mean, there's there's all sorts of interesting things. Thanks, dude. Uh there's all sorts of interesting things that are gonna happen on in your daily commute for instance like like grognard solo gaming gonna, about to do a commute like there's all these things that pop up and they they hold passing interest and then you just kind of like okay you know that's you'll never see that again i mean i honestly think about that a lot like i look at people a lot and i'm like am i ever going to see that person again have i ever seen that person again um and i don't mean to get too like woo woo philosophical with that but like this is what makes this is what gives a game verisimilitude i think that solo role players know this more than group role players i want to give an example and this is going to be pretty far-fetched if you've ever seen the show sopranos is one of the best dialogue written shows of all time and most of the best dialogue in that show is just bullshit they're just like talking to each other they're just reading the news and reacting to it right and because of that it feels lived in the same thing with the wire if you've ever seen the wire it does a really good job at this of having banality and obviously there has to be a balance right because if there's too much banality then you're like why am i watching a show i already have enough banality in my life 
But if you've ever seen the movie that came out of Sopranos lately, and it sucked, The Many Saints in Newark, a lot of people were like, why did this movie suck? It has all the pieces I liked. It had Junior Soprano, it had Tony Soprano. It literally had James Gandolfini's son playing young Tony Soprano. Why did this suck? It sucked because it was too much plot and not enough real. There wasn't enough of what made Soprano so charming, which is like this, this space in between plot that gave the plot room to breathe and made the world that, it, that, that this show uh, lived in to feel, yeah, Charles like a, like a moving world. It felt like something that was breathing, okay? And so I think that because we really almost have to take our time as solo role players, because if we try to go too fast, we're going to like exhaust our, um, you know, divergent thought capabilities. We're not going to be able to keep generating new ideas. Right. And so we have to stay with things a little bit longer than people who maybe are playing with a group of five people who don't want to sit there and talk to a man on a bench about, you know, that he used to be a track and field champion when he was a teenager. But as a solo player, you're like, well, what else do I have to do right now? Right. And it's like, if you're just, if you just want to go from battle to battle and fight and fight and fight, then probably like a board game is a better option. I'm not even being like, you know, <laughs> trying to be an a-hole like, Oh, if you don't like what we do get out. Like, honestly, that's the reason you'd play a solo role-playing game as opposed to something where you're just constantly rolling D6s or whatever, is that you you want to live in a moving, inhabited world. Um, let's add one more person in the village square here. Or maybe, uh, is there something that we can... Okay, um, we'll say Declan Harp. Okay, Declan is a... 40 year old man who seems to have trouble um, establishing eye contact while speaking, staring past your shoulder into the middle distance as he addresses you. It gives his words a quality of heaviness but you're not certain if that's from what he's saying or just the way that he is saying it. There you go. That's something right off the top of my dome. Um, he, if, if he likes you, he may ask for a favor. He doesn't have anything to give in return right now, right now. I also wanted to add to Bim Benders. <laughs> I love that name, Bim Benders. Um, sorry, I am, despite the fact that I kind of write recklessly, I am a little bit, I do think I wanna bold these just so that I can keep my, it's easy for my eyes to follow. Um, yeah, I wanted to add to Bim Benders here, a local recluse who does a lot of hollering at the local kids in between long sessions of being reclusive. A bit ornery, he doesn't necessarily shoo visitors off right away, especially if they seem to have a purpose. Um, if you have a way of impressing Bim, he may be interested in spending some time teaching you. There you go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. This is good. This is a nice little outskirts here, right? So we'll say Bradley. Um, where's... Uh, And rations, uh, we'll go food. If anyone likes this music, please check out Witan Music, W-I-T-A-N. Witan is, I put it in the description of the video. 
uh, friend of the channel gave me permission to play this music during the streams. Uh, really, really cool. Um, and I, and I'm on the description for this video. Actually, it has the uh, actual, I think, page that you can find them on. Uh, so what would we call this? Um, rest. Oops. Food. And we'll call this rest and um, table of travelers. Okay. Um, Thanks, Charles. I was really happy to have you here. Are you leaving? Or are you just saying thanks for the music? Either one's cool. Uh, barkeep. What would an RPG be without a bar? Get a little space here. I do not drink, but I drink very often while I'm playing role-playing games. Um, my characters drink, I don't. There we go. Okay. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good here. I'm trying to think of if we want to add anything else to the village square. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm creating some new waypoints in the outskirts right now. And I'm trying to make sure that I'm covering all the bases that of stuff that, um, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. I learned a lot from you too. Um, Charles in the comments is, is a very excellent RPG writer as well. Can't wait to see, can't wait to take to the high seas. All right, so the other things we have right now in the outskirts is there's a mill where you get rations, a smithy where you get weapons, then there's a temple area. I don't think... We should have a place that spawns random events, right? Um, common items can be purchased from Master... Okay, so that should, so we should do something with common all common items for sale at Bradley and Sons. Uncommon items, rations available. Um, we'll do we'll do weapons. We'll do. Let's just make one shop. Why why, why waste time? Okay, all common. Uh, weapons for sale. Uncommon weapons are also for sale if you have already been to the green. Rare items not available. Okay, so let's add in the town square, we'll say a sudden gathering and a crowd has suddenly formed encircling some sort of rabble at its center. The crowd gathered so quickly that you weren't able to see what the fuss was all about. Um, it could be a conflict or a game or maybe something you would never expect to see in a village square. Paradoxically, that's kind of what village squares are all about. Uh, so we'll say here, um, 
roll random event from page 16 of the Dragon Bane core adventure book. I think that's page 16. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. Oh. Okay. My um, submission for Pocket Quest, I'll see if that gets in, I think, next weekend. Uh, and um, I'll, I will, I will uh, any, anyone who, I'm selling it, I think, for a dollar on Drive-Thru RPG. I don't know if they're going to change the price of that, if they put it in a compendium or something. But uh, when that comes out, if could, I'll uh, shoot up the link to that. Um, I was going to say, if you don't have a dollar, I'll just give it to you. But <laughs> if you don't have a dollar, like, let me know that uh, maybe we need to help you with more than like um, uh, an RPG. <laughs> if you need, maybe you're in a little more trouble than that. Um, yeah, so here we go. Page 16. Um, nice. Okay, so this is random events on 15. I think I'm going to make my own rumors table. I think I'm going. I think I have to. Mm -hmm. I think I have to make a rumors table. Because if I use the rumors in that adventure book, it's going to tell them stuff about that main quest. So, table of travelers. A group of folks in the back, two women and three men, sit silently and drink from their mugs. All of them look a little shell-shocked, staring in the middle distance. Perhaps they know something you don't. Yeah. Um, so this sudden gathering, roll random events from page 15 of the Dragon War Core Adventure Group or or create your own using the Oracle tables. I don't know why I capitalized that. I have these like very weird random capitalization rules that just pop out of nowhere. I have no idea. Sometimes I just like feel it in my bones that something should be capitalized. It's so weird. So that's, let's see, that's five places. I really have to stop myself from going overboard here. Oh, wow. That's actually a good idea. What if we made it a wishing well? A well just to the east of the village square used to be a main source of water years ago, but since then it's what the hell just happened. Okay, the main source of water for the outskirts years ago, but since then it has been a source of despair more than hydration. There is only a small pool of brown, dirty water at the bottom and so it has become a sort of ironic wishing well 
that people throw buttons into instead of coins. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that's good. Uh, okay. Um, so... What do we want to say? Uh, night time. Night time sneaking. Uh, there have been reports lately that teenagers. Okay, how about this? There have always been reports that the wishing well is a site for teenagers to um, meet at after dark to get up to all the sorts of trouble that teenagers usually find themselves in. Lately, however, a rumor has been circulating that they stopped going after an event occurred that none of them will talk about. Melvin Snackley, uh, approximately 16 years old, with a wide and honest face. Melvin sees you looking at the well and just as soon as your eyes meet his he quickly averts his gaze and shuffles away in a hurry possibly refer to rumors table on page no, we'll do it in the appendix. We have our, we got our own rumors. Yeah, I dig that. I also like the name Melvin Snackley. That's a good idea. Thank you, Charles. Charles, what can we put as a third thing here? Since whoever my chat thing keeps disappearing. Okay. Um. Uh, button toss. A local child no older than five sees you looking at the well and informs and without prompting says the number six up in your in in your general direction uh, reacting to your confusion the child adds not my age the that's the percent we think that this well has a 6% wish fulfillment <laughs> rating. <laughs> uh, however, it is... Oops, sorry. Damn, I keep doing that. However... It is a town tradition for new for everyone to toss at least one button into the well. Will you toss a button? The child asks. And why not? Sort of like a weird little thing, right? But I kind of like that. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's an investigation. I mean, it could be. I'm just like, I'm just creating ideas. You know, like I'm just, I'm just thinking like this could be something that a person could weave into something else. It, it, some of it is just stupid. You know, like it's stupid. <laughs> like, like it doesn't mean anything um, or it could, you know, I don't know. All right, I think that's pretty good for um, for the outskirts. And I can add something to that if I think so. But I have these events here. And then we'll maybe like hold for a picture right here. We'll insert a shape. I think I've also um, I had a lot of really good um i've had a lot of really good people contact me with like their art and it looked really good however i like loved all of it i'm not even kidding i loved everything that people sent me but i think that um there are two people that i, I really am interested in their style and I, I might um team up with them to do put a couple pieces in here so we'll see home of, oh geez All right, so that's that's the outskirts. Um, I also created this hotel muck route, but I'm sort of starting to wonder if I should put hotel muck route right after the outskirts. I can't have like a hotel and a um, there also should be maybe like an inciting event in the outskirts now that I think about it. Hmm. I don't know, folks. It's hard to decide these things. It's like when you're writing this stuff, sometimes one of the hardest things is the vastness of the possibilities. Like I could put anything I want in here and that is really liberating, but it's also a little bit paralyzing sometimes because it's like, Gosh, what do I, what's going to be fun? I really love the, the people I've created, the, the whisper hands. I really like them. They have this belief that if you're really quiet, um, you could hear the trees and the trees are, um, these like really twisted, ugly trees by our standards. Um, but to them, they're really beautiful trees. They have just like a whole different aesthetic um, sort of outlook that uh, we do. I like their little map here. They don't really know what outskirts is called. This is made by the frog people. Um, so they're, uh, yeah, so that's like their prayer. Um, if you look right here, the shamans of their people often say that silence is a form of prayer through which they can be blessed with the song of the bitterwood trees and the spirits of their ancestors who dwell within. And their villages are called stilts. I like that. I just want to say, if you're someone who makes an RPG and you don't know how to do any art, like, I made this picture by drawing it on a sheet of paper and then I took a picture of it and then I like just put it through a couple filters and it looks like some reeds in the night sky and I have no talent. And so whatever's stopping you from creating your thing, don't, don't let it because it's fine. Like, I think one of the problems with I mean, don't get me wrong. I kind of love where we where we're at with RPGs right now, where there's so many indie RPGs and there's so many options and there's so many like beautiful, cool things. I mean, I, I currently am like backing like five Kickstarters right now. I'm kickstarting um, the new Zweihander. I'm kickstarting uh, Coriolis. I'm kickstarting Sundered Isles. But one of the problems is that all of these are so damn beautiful now. 
And so if somebody wants to get into this and they're like, man, I should make my own, but I don't know how to do any of this stuff. It's like, you just got to remember that a lot of those, even the ones from Free League, and I love Free League, but Free League is like 20 people at least, you know, and you're just, if you're just one person, you can't be good at everything. So just do your best and then, you know, reach out for collaborations because I put up that post that was just like, hey, can somebody help me with this art? And I got so many people that responded I mean, it's beautiful. And, and, and okay. It's like, I have 1290 followers. If you need some help and you want to recruit some people, just let me know. And I can put up a post for you. Um, because I'd just be happy to help because, um, I really, yeah. Oh man. Moses does such good art. Yeah. That's like ridiculous. That's ridiculous. He put up a post the other day. This is, um, uh, what's the name of his channel? Um, Will, Will own his cave. He put up a post yesterday where he's like, hey, check out the shading on these steps. And he's, and I thought this was really good. He's like, you know, people ask me like, what, what's, how do you do the shading so well? It's so easy. And he's like, this took me like five hours. <laughs> and he was like shaded like a set of stairs. Um, and you know, like, uh, for instance, when I did this pocket quest, I had to learn how to do, I finally had to learn how to do affinity publisher. I wasn't going to do InDesign cause I'm not rich, but like I've been putting that off for so long. I just did not want to learn how to do layout software, but suddenly I was like, well, what if I can do that? What if it's, what if it's possible for me to do that? And it was. And then here's another thing I want to say, and I just want to keep saying stuff because why not? Because it's 1.30 and I have work in like five hours. If you don't want to make games, don't make them. Just play them. In fact, sometimes I wish that I just wanted to play these games because that's really, that's really my favorite thing to do. But if you have that thing in you where you're like, I have to create this thing or else I'm going to puke, then you got to answer that call. But I think this is another thing that can afflict like a lot of solo RPG channels is like, it feels like everybody's making their own mods and like their own supplements and their own adventures and sharing. You don't have to do any of that. You really don't. You just can play. You just play. Also, and this is a video I'm thinking of making soon. And I don't know if it's a good video to make or not, but like, I feel that you could play solo RPG with no RPG book. I think if you have a good enough, a couple good oracles, you know, you get a book like this that just has like some good oracles or you have like an RPG like Iron Sworn Star Force that has like a lot of good oracles in it. I literally think you can use like two D6s and, and just create a game completely. You don't even need these books. You don't need them. You really don't. These books are good, right? They're going to create some ideas, but after you do this long enough, you start to real, realize that like there are only so many things that you can do. And that's not even in RPGs. It's like human nature. Let me, let me try this out on you. Like, why is it that no matter what universe, there's always basically the same archetypes, which is like orc, elf, human, goblin, right? You could, you could translate it to anything and you could say something like Mass Effect, but what I would say about Mass Effect, and one of the reasons I find it incredibly boring, is that Mass Effect, every alien is just like a human. Just like a human, but with like blue skin. Any game that has, you know, you look at Warhammer. Warhammer is orcs, elves, dwarves, right? Because these things are part of like our subconscious. They are imprints in our subconscious. They represent certain things. And there are only so many typologies that you can make. And there's a reason why if I say I'm going to make a game where like the, the races are like puddle of water, biscuits, uh, um, cu cup people, and mosquito tongues, that doesn't resonate. It doesn't mean anything because it does not appeal to these sort of these union imprints these archetypes so all i'm saying is you you got everything you need to solo rpg in your head uh but what i do not have in my head is many more minutes of being awake so i just want to thank everyone 
who stopped by. I'll hopefully post this video up just in the live vids. Um, I hate folding my clothes and writing alone. And so both of those things, I appreciate the company and I appreciate you all coming. I hope you have a wonderful night or day or wherever you are. And um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Brad, I agree with that. I agree with that. They won't be familiar. Let me give you a 100. Can I do that? Oh man. I clicked like the thing to give you a 100 and it like totally deleted my chat. Uh, okay. All right. Thanks everybody for stopping by and, uh,